Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by returning guest, although it has been a very long time, uh, Dr. Seaver Wang. Um, Seaver, you are a oceanographer. Uh, you're also, I'm going to get you to kind of do your own little introduction here, but you, you work at the Breakthrough Institute, um, and I'll, I'll get, let you give your title. Um, we are going to be chatting about deep sea mining, and this is uh, an issue that I have been fascinated by for over a year. Um, and I've been trying to find the right person to talk to. And for whatever reason, that's been really difficult. I've, uh, you know, been bugging my friends over at the Australian, uh, there's the Mineral Council of Australia, and, and they weren't able to come up with any real good names for me. Um, I saw you uh, put an article out recently um, on this very topic. And then I remembered that, yeah, you are a ocean scientist. Um, I'm blundering through your introduction. So yeah, just take 60 seconds, tell us who you are and and why you love the ocean and and you know, why, why you stumbled across this topic. Yes, thanks so much for having me again, Chris. It's uh, good to be back. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm Seaver Wang. I am co-director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, so as, as Chris mentioned, my background is originally in oceanography. I was an ocean biogeochemist and my, an, an ocean microbial ecologist. I studied the interaction between surface ocean plankton and the carbon and nitrogen cycles. Uh, and so I, so, uh, so as Chris mentioned, you know, I, I, I came to this uh, topic from a very interesting angle. I came to it originally, I was actually an opponent of, of deep sea mining, um, even as recently as, uh, as three or four years ago. Um, but as I, uh, as I learned, as I learned more, particularly about how we actually source metals and materials on land, I came to look at the at the topic from from a different angle. Um, uh, so my current work at the Breakthrough Institute is on uh, supply chains for clean energy technologies. We do a lot of our work on on mining, on uh, ore processing, on metal smelting, and on manufacturing. Basically, how do we get all of the the uh, electric vehicle batteries, or wind turbines, or uh, copper copper for transformers? Um, that we think we're going to need for the energy transition. And so particularly in the process of doing that work, I've come to understand sort of the environmental footprint of extraction sort of as it, as it is uh, currently, the status quo, the, uh, the sort of the conventional approaches for mining. And after learning more about deep sea mining and weighing the impacts, um, uh, I, I've come to sort of uh, change my mind uh, on, on the topic, actually. Well, uh, you know, strong opinions loosely held. And uh, was it John Maynard Keynes? Uh, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Um, so, yeah, I always love, uh, I mean, this isn't like a conversion story, uh, you know, it's all on the road to Damascus or anything. But I, I do love that. I love when people can be flexible in their thinking. Um, so, yeah, Seaver, I mean, I think very similar things are drawing me towards this technology, but I'm, I'm uh, far less informed than you are. So maybe first off, though, let's frame it. I mean, terrestrial mining is pretty uh, intense stuff. Um, um, you know, we're we're using a lot of explosives to blow up a lot of rock, and we're blowing up more and more of that rock because the ore grades are dropping, and we need to uh, therefore process more of that base rock, remove more overburden, um, crush it up. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Um, I was talking to Ed Conway recently, his great book, The Material World, where he really, you know, goes behind. I, I always kind of use this metaphor of the grocery store. He goes behind the shop aisle to see how the sausage gets made, and he follows, you know, sand. Uh, steel, lithium, a, a number of different sort of material inputs through their supply chains. And it's absolutely fascinating. Check out the interview we just did a few weeks ago with him. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, he goes through how um, copper ore grades, for instance, and like the the bronze uh, age, you know, you could find deposits that were like 20% copper. Um, and they've dropped to sort of 6% in 1900. And I think 1% in the year 2000 and 0.6% now. And you know, there may be enough minerals available. I'm not sure how that's, you know, in terms of reserves and resources, but we got to use a lot more energy to crush them up even finer and extract these declining ore grades. So the idea that there's these, you know, nice little nodules of fairly high purity ore down there seems exciting. But yeah, sorry, I went on a diatribe. Tell me a little bit more, though, about your thoughts, you know, and how kind of, I don't want to say dirty and nasty um, terrestrial mining is, but yeah, I mean those are those are value laden words, but but lead me through your your little journey of conversion and and what you've looked at in terms of uh, of terrestrial mining that that makes the deep sea stuff look not so bad, and then we'll talk about what exactly deep sea is. Yes, yes. Um. So and that's and that's a very important uh, uh, follow up question: what deep sea mining actually is, because I think uh, um, uh, that's often where a lot a lot of people sort of jump to assumptions about about what they think it is. 
um, and and maybe are often surprised to to sort of uh, learn what it actually what it actually would entail. Um, but co conventional mining uh, um, uh, is typically uh, so so typically uh, the um, the way you get metals uh, um, in our uh, as it is is you if the deposits are close to the surface you do a, a surface mine uh, um, and uh, so you know some sometimes called an open pit mine you remove a, a lot of overburden to get to the ore, ore body and then you remove sort of the and then you uh, remove successive layers of of the target deposit um or if the deposit is much deeper um you you do underground you want to do underground mining you drop mine shafts and then you actually tunnel into those uh rock layers uh deep underground sometimes uh, several kilometers even underground um and so I, I want to avoid casting terrestrial mining too much as, you know, abhorrent or horrible, because the fact of the matter is that it is actually the foundation of industrial civilization. Um, you, you go around walking in a modern city and, you know, you've got uh, copper cables in all the circuit boxes next to you. You've got, um, uh, you know, uh, steel in railings, in, in, uh, uh, in rebar. Uh, in reinforcing in reinforcing you know steel uh, columns all all around you, so um, the the entirety of of sort of uh, modern civilization depends upon metals. If we didn't mine metals, uh, we would still be you know hunter gatherers. So um, so recognizing that you know there's always we should always be pushing ourselves to to mine better, and and we have been. Uh, terrestrial mining has even improved uh, significantly uh, in you know the last twenty to to 40 years even, um, uh, particularly when you look at metrics that uh, that people don't that people sometimes don't think about, for example, su such as worker safety. Um, uh, that said, at the end of the day, terrestrial terrestrial mining, you're moving large quantities of earth, uh, um, uh, you know, on the order of tens to hundreds to thousands of kilograms of earth for every kilogram of metal that you're that you're actually um, uh, turning into a finished product at the end, and um, you're disturbing large quantities of Earth's surface, less so for an underground mine, but but uh, but a significant amount for for a surface mine, um, and that you know is essentially clear cutting the the surface vegetation, and then because you're you're doing all of this digging, uh, you have to drain an underground mine to make sure it doesn't it doesn't flood, uh, and then you've got these piles of of tailings, which is the the um, the rock that's within the ore body that uh, that isn't actually the valuable product, as well as sort of other waste rock like the overburden that you remove that's sitting in piles, and because it's been de sort of um, dug up into fine material and deposited as large piles, um, that creates risks for water pollution because when it rains on those piles, um, it's more easy because now the surface areas of those materials is larger. Uh, for um, potentially uh, unpleasant stuff to, to leach, leach around. And, you know, there are controls for all of this. Um, you know, we line our tailings piles now. Um, uh, you, uh, you sort of have to submit mine plans that take into account the local hydrology to make sure that stuff doesn't get into the water table. But all the same, um, these, these risks are, are some, of these, some of these differences are, are just sort of inherent because at the end of the day, you are digging. Uh, to get to get these materials, and then also there's a vast disparity globally in how mining is done, which may mean that standards uh, vary significantly from country to country, uh, which may increase or decrease the relative environmental risk. Right, right, and I mean fundamentally we are terrestrial creatures, um, and sometimes these compete for space. I'm thinking of uh, you know not to choose too politicized of an example, but uh, the German open pit lignite mines, which are consuming villages and communities that are being evacuated and historic churches that are being felled. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've uh, traveled a fair amount in, uh, in Central America and South America, and sometimes those conflicts are very real um, and local farming communities are, are very impacted. So, um, yeah, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about um, deep sea mining. Why don't you start off with the actual geology of these deposits? Uh, or even just, like, let's get super meta and just talk about how, you know, ores tend to concentrate themselves because, um, it's funny, like they are renewable resources, like where do these minerals come from? How do they deposit themselves? But the time frame of their renewal is, you know, hundreds of millions of years, I think, in many cases. So if, if you want to go meta there and just in general, how mineral deposits kind of concentrate. Um, but, you know, zooming in on what the hell's going on on the uh, the deep sea uh, seafloor, I think that's that's kind of the area of fascination. 
Sure, sure. And I'll start by uh, scoping this conversation a bit because there are actually several types of seafloor mining, and we're really only going to be talking about one type here, which is uh, polymetallic nodules. Um, so there are other kinds of seafloor mining that have been proposed that in many way, in some cases, they actually look like like uh, conventional mining, but you're just doing it on the seafloor, you know, digging uh, ocean crusts or or lopping off uh, ocean hydrothermal vents to, to mine. And that's not what we're talking about. That would be higher higher impact uh, kind of work. So what we are talking about are polymetallic nodules. And polymetallic nodules are roughly p- potato-sized accretions of, uh, of mostly manganese, of heavily manganese. They're around 30% manganese by mass. And then, in, um, and then there are smaller quantities of, of nickel, copper, and cobalt uh, in that order that, um, uh, that have accumulated in these nodules. And these nodules have accumulated through sort of natural ocean mineralo- uh, mineralogical and, and chemical processes. Uh, like Chris said, they've accumulated over, over tens to hundreds of millions of years into these sort of potato-sized rocks. And it's a natural process. You would expect them to, um, to, to regrow but again, on, on vast geological timescales, I think it is probably um, fairer to say that they are non, non-renewable, yeah. um, particularly on our, on our very measly short uh, human timescales. Um, uh, but there's great differences in, in you know, these polymetallic nodules, which are literally just sitting on the seafloor, um, sort of you know, half buried or, or even just sitting entirely on top of the seafloor versus ocean crusts or hydrothermal vent minerals that are, that are locked in in sort of fixed deposits. The difference being that you can actually go and pick up these nodules. And so what we're, ta- what we're talking about when it, when it comes to so, so-called de- deep sea mining or DSM, which is really just nodule collection, is sending uh, robotic uh, remotely operated vehicles down to the seafloor. And then these vehicles will use one of several techniques. Uh, most commonly, they're using water jets to actually, actually suspend these uh, nodules, sort of um, uh, mobilize the sediment underneath them uh, and and sort of get them to float and then suck these these nodules uh, into the vehicle and then transport them uh, via pump via a hydraulic pump up to a collector vessel on the seafloor. So you think it's got a, you've got a collector vessel on the on the sea surface, sorry, a collector vessel on the sea surface. You've got a long pipe leading down to a robotically controlled uh, vehicle. Um, and that's that's it. That's the system. Um, so so you compare that to a land-based mine or some of the alternative seafloor mining techniques, which have been discussed. Which so far I will op- I oppose the other the other techniques. You know, ocean crustal mining or or um, hydrothermal vent mining. Uh, um, but the footprint is much smaller. It's 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 almost basically like driving a driving a little car over the over the surface of the ocean and picking up what's in the car's path, pretty much. Right. Well, let, let's talk kind of a little more philosophically about humanity's uh, relationship to the ocean, uh, particularly modern humanity uh, and, and I guess more of the kind of romantic modern humanity's uh, conceptions and thoughts about the ocean. Um, like I think the frames of reference I have for this, like what other resources do we pull from the ocean? Well, we, you know, we pull fish out of the ocean and we use these, you know, factory trawler ships and probably, you know, over subsidize and over harvest and screw up that renewable resource. Um, the ocean's been used, I guess, as like a dumping ground in the past. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about, yeah, how I guess particularly like industrial Homo sapiens uh, have interacted with the ocean and, and how we sort of have started to philo- philosophically think about it and how that's become conceptualized into certain laws and treaties. Because I understand that right now um, this deep sea mining ain't even legal. Right. Um, so the list is long and, and and quite exhaustive of the ways in which humanity interacts with the ocean currently. So there's, of course, the indirect impacts like climate change, which results in ocean acidification, uh, other changes in ocean chemistry uh, and, and ocean physics. Um, there is uh, a nutrient pollution. So because we, we use, you know, large amounts of fertilizer on land and uh, because of other sort of nutrient inputs like uh, sewage, for example, um, the uh, were were uh, introducing a lot of nutrients via rivers um, into uh, coastal oceans, which has dramatically changed the biogeochemistry of sort of uh, uh, coastal wa- coastal waters. And then you know there are more there are more sort of direct economic activities like fishing being being one of the largest ones. Um, we a, a major one that people don't often think about is just ocean shipping. You know, a, a large amount of, of of large ocean vessels transit the ocean each day, transporting you know upwards of ninety five percent of of uh, 
of human trade and commerce. Um, the uh, and you know those vessels have impacts like noise, um, uh, 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 particulate pollution, etc., um, that have affected the ocean now for uh, well over you know 150 years at this point. Um, there is in and because of that commerce actually, and this goes back even further to the days of sail. There have actually been impacts as well from introduction of invasive species. Um, you know, stuff hitches a ride on boats and then gets brought to new areas where sometimes it turns out to be very, very well suited to those areas and sort of outcompetes the existing um, uh, organisms there. And, you know, invasion is is in many ways a natural process, too, because stuff can raft over on logs as well. But humans have sort of accelerated this process inadvertently, even if, um, um, you know, even if it happened previously. And then, you know, we actually do modify the seafloor already. You know, we do oil and gas extraction. Uh, we lay large amounts of uh, subsurface cables, not just for electricity, but also for telecommunications. Um, you know, and, and it's worth noting, too, that, um, you know, the seabed is vast. And so, um, you know, the impacts of any of those activities, be it oil and gas extraction or laying transatlantic cables or, or deep sea mining, we're really talking about very, very small a minuscule really percentages of the of the seafloor um uh, uh because the seafloor is is vast it's two-thirds of the ocean surface compared to the one-third of, of sort of land surface area that uh that we have but that's the that's you know the a, a quick snapshot and not even not even exa- exhaustive you know there's right. stuff like uh, right. dynamite mining coral harvesting etc but um right. but the humans humans in, basically the point is humans interact a lot with the ocean already and we have and- to recognize that yeah. So, so that was kind of impacts. And then in terms of resources that we take out, I mean, obviously whales was an early one fish fishing and we've overfished. And when people, I think talk about, well, you know, well, it sounds like this is small localized activities. They think about the enormous impacts humanity has had an aggregate on fish stocks, et cetera. I mean, we, I guess we also mine a lot of sand from the ocean. Um, I mean, more from, I guess, little like islands and, and reefs and stuff, but I mean, sand, uh, especially right. construction worthy sand seems to be um, something of a uh, tight commodity uh, in some places. So, um, yeah, I, I'm curious. Like, so you said it's a small uh, subsection of the, uh, the ocean surface. Why, why is it deep? Like, do these things not form in, in shallower continental shelves? Uh, like, why, why do you get these little potato nodules? They sound pretty, you know, cool and crazy to me. Why do they form where they do? And what what is this widespread across the deep oceans? Because as you said, that's that's a big space. Yeah, so my inor- so admittedly my inorganic chemistry is is pretty poor. That was my worst ever uh, grade in 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 uh, um, uh, throughout my undergraduate and graduate studies. Um, so I, I I I don't actually know the precise answer to that. Um, but I yeah I do know that that these deposits are only found at at great depths. So we're talking three to five ish kilometers. And and in terms of like that sounds technically challenging. Um, so how far along is this technology? Um, you know, I, I, I've heard of like calls to just ban it outright. It, it reminds me a little bit of, um, geoengineering where there's this tension between like, Hey, maybe we're going to need this stuff. We should probably do the science. And then other people saying, if we do the science, we're more likely to do it. Um, it's going to have unanticipated consequences. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is like a, a new frontier. So, so how is that sort of, um, uh, proceeding? Yeah, so it's new, but it's all. But like many ideas in mining, it's also old, actually. So, so you know, many innovative new mining techniques. Um, you know, be it uh, sort of, you know, extracting metals using you know solution, so-called solution mining, using using uh, um, uh, using sort of liquids, pumping liquids into the, into rock layers to get metals, um, or uh, deep sea mining. These ideas actually often date back to the to the sixties and seventies. We were aware of the existence. Of manganese modules, uh, um, uh, I, even I believe you know in the in the mid twentieth century, um, and it's been it, it, so so these materials have been coveted for a long time, but um, uh, as might be expected, it's only very recently sort of with advances in particularly with advances in sort of remotely operated vehicles that have made it um, uh, um, more feasible economically to, to actually think about, uh, um, harvest, collecting these rocks, uh, uh, at commercially speaking, uh, and at, at sort of economic costs. Um, so, so that, uh, uh, so the, the true sort of industrial interest is, is really only more recent within the last 20 years or so, I'd say. So you described briefly, you know, this, this kind of robot that goes around vacuum cleaning these things up, uh, shunting them to the surface, uh, where there's this vessel, 
Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can go into that in, in uh, a little more detail so people can understand also what people are saying the impacts would be. What, what are the environmental harms of stirring up this uh, deep sea floor? Uh, how kind of ecologically diverse or valuable is it? I mean, again, this is turning into sort of human value propositions, but uh, people tend to like uh, weird and exotic environments and, and biodiversity and things like that. So is this just like a dead, you know, barren space far from any any light and energy flows? Or is there a lot going on down uh, in Nodua land? Sure. Yeah, there are lots of questions there. I'll start with the second with the second half. Sure. Um, you know, you 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 talk about people uh, uh, really valuing sort of you know exotic ex- sort of extreme environments, and I might actually challenge that proposition a bit because having worked on even surface ocean plankton for five years, my takeaway really from 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 all of that work was that very few lay people actually care. Um, right, you know right. about plankton and and surface ocean plankton are actually important, but deep <laughs> ocean pl- deep ocean organisms are are you know realistically speaking infinitely less important than surface ocean microbes. I mean surface ocean microbes are are actually very important, um, but this is a very barren uh, landscape. We're talking about um, uh, 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 the uh, the abyssal seafloor where you know there isn't a single scrap of light down down there. Much of the ocean, basically, uh, aside from a few autotrophs, a few sort of uh, organisms that can make their own energy um, through very, through, uh, the 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 entirety of that ecosystem subsists essentially off of the detritus that falls down from the surface ocean, and it's very very little uh, and uh, biomass uh, down there, living biomass down there in the deep ocean. On the abyssal seafloor, we're talking like ten grams of living biomass per square meter, compared to say. 20 to 40 kilograms of, of, of living life in like a temperate to tropical forest on land. Um, so orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude difference in, in the richness of biomass. Now, that being said, uh, we, we, we have to be sort of clear eyed about what the, upfr- the impacts of deep sea mining would actually be. So certainly anything in the path of the collector vehicle, um, the, 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 up, the collector vehicle is expected to disturb like approximately the, fir- the upper six to eight um, centimeters of sediment. And, you know, it's going to subject, uh, uh, anything caught, um, you know, on the surface or, or buried to that depth to, you know, large differences in large differences in pressure. It's going to sort of rip them out of their environment. And so, you know, the real operating assumption is, is that those vehicles are going to, to, to kill anything, uh, uh, that's caught up within the, the collect, the path of the harvester. Now that isn't any different from you know bulldozers that are bulldozing you know uh, Indonesian rainforest for a nickel mine uh, for a conventional nickel mine today, um, but it but it is an impact and we have to be clear eyed about that. The other impacts uh, so so you know the the collector vehicle is also sucking up a lot of sediment with the nodules as it's doing this, and the sediment is going to be ejected from the back of the vehicle um, just at the ocean surface. And there are concerns that this creates a plume, a plume of sort of fine suspended sediments, uh, and that that plume could travel a, a great distance horizontally or vertically and sort of rain down as snow on the sea floor. There are organisms down on the sea floor that, for example, use uh, filters to feed, like sea, lily, sea lilies. They're trying to catch particles. And the concern is that they might be catching a lot of the sediment as well, and that might negatively impact them. Or if the sediment plume is even thick enough, it could bury seafloor life. And then the final impacts that people are concerned about are, are noise, as the nodules are sort of rattling up and getting pumped up to the to the surface uh, vessel. And also, there are there are minor impacts like light, for example, from the collector vehicles in in this area that's you know pitch pitch dark. And just to clarify, that plume is happening out the back end of the vehicle, or it's up at the surface near the uh, surface collector ship. Uh, so that's a, that's an incisive question. So there is a plume uh, at, at the out the back of the vehicle. Um, but then, of course, as the nodules are pumped up to the to the surface uh, vessel, there are there is some sediment that's transported up as well. Um, so currently, the direction in which draft regulations seem to be leaning is that they will require these uh, these operators to return that 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 water, that excess water, and uh, and remaining sediment back down to near near the ocean seafloor seafloor, if not at the ocean seafloor. So it'll be returned at a depth of like three or four kilometers down as well. And that, that, that plume of return water and fine sediment is going to be a lot more dilute in terms of sediment than the uh, plume coming out the collector vessel. 
So you hear, um, or I've heard anyway, um, that there's sort of deserts in the ocean where there's just no fertilizer. They're not, you know, there's an excess of, <laughs> of, of, of uh, fertile ingredients uh, coming mostly from, I guess, our ammonia production and, and down our, our riverbeds. And uh, I, I think it's called like alluvial dust off of glaciers and things like that. Um, would a little bit of sediment be good in these areas to like, pair, you know, might, might blanket some, uh, deep ocean life, but it might also fertilize, um, some of the more active upper parts of, of the ocean, which, which could benefit. Is there, is there a cost benefit analysis here of that? <laughs> um, so I don't think so because, so first off, now that it seems like the mine operators will be required to return this water at great depth, the surface, the surface ocean community would largely, one would think be unaffected. Um, uh, by these activities. Uh, and then at depth, uh, this is an environment where nutrients are not the limiting factor. Nut in fact, the, the deep ocean is already very nutrient rich. Um, so the so think of the deep ocean as where all the decomposition happens. You know, stuff dies or, or fish poop, and it sinks all the way down to the deep ocean where that stuff then gets decomposed by microbial life, by, by, by mi microorganisms, um, and by sort of uh, um, uh, scavengers. Uh, and so it gets broken down into its, you know, constituent carbon, which, which uh, the, so the deep ocean is very rich in carbon, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as nutrients. So the deep ocean is already nutrient rich. And so reintroducing those sediment finds into the deep ocean would not change that. It's other factors um, uh, like, light for, like light, for instance, um, uh, the very, very cold temperatures of the deep ocean, which restrict metabolism, and even the rich, and even sort of, um, uh, um, uh, and, and because uh, organisms have to be so well adapted to those pressures, to that sort of harsh environment, um, the trade-offs, the evolutionary trade-offs they had to make to survive to survive in that environment means they're not going to just sort of like uh, uh, multiply like a harmful yeah. algal bloom would yeah. on the surface. Right. Okay. So I'm going to have to take a slight tangential turn here because I was listening to uh, my friend Nate Hagen's podcast and he had uh, Sir Somebody. Is a, he's a big climate scientist in the UK who advised, I think, the Blair government and a few others. Um, and he's passionate about this project and this has nothing to do with deep sea mining. So forgive this, Seaver and the audience. But it was a cool idea. Basically, he talks about how like whale poo is, uh, you know, a massive sort of source of, of uh, fertilizer uh, throughout the ocean. And, and he had this plan. Um, as I think a, a way to sort of sink carbon, because when when whales, uh, I guess, take a dump on the ocean, it, it's a it's a huge source of sort of fertility, obviously drops to the bottom as well. But it's sort of trying to emulate that with um, taking, I think, again, like alluvial um, particle and sediment from Greenland, putting it on rice husks, so it would float and sort of have some presence in the upper ocean and serve as like a, a source of, I guess, like a plankton bloom that then would settle down and sink some carbon. This is a total aside. I'm not sure if you know anything about it, but I guess the reason I'm asking it is because it sounds like, well, if you take this nutrient rich material up from the floor, like why not put it up in the surface where, you know, I guess there's just very little energy flow outside of these thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. You got energy and not as much nutrient on the top. Uh, am I just being totally naive again in terms of a cost benefit analysis? And and like, why, why not put some nutrients up on the, on the ocean surface and maybe that'd be good for climate or for fish stocks or something else? So you'd have to you'd you'd really have to um, sort of do the science and, and figure out whether this makes sense because particularly if you're bringing deep water nutrients to the surface, um, you're really going to have to be careful about also bringing up deep 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 ocean carbon, um, and and sort of counteracting the effect the fertilizing effect that you're you're trying to talk about here because the deep ocean really is very rich in carbon dioxide and so if you're ventilating a large amount of of, uh, of deep ocean CO two to the surface. You you might really be you might really be better off just you know planting trees instead or uh, you know direct doing uh, doing some other sort of carbon removal method. Um, but this general idea of ocean fertilization, you know, if, for example, if you're taking you know uh, um, uh, alluvial iron or or artificial iron and or you know and, and nutrients and introducing into the ocean, um, you know that wouldn't have the same sort of deep ocean carbon concern that you're talking about. Um, and this has been thought about for a long time. Uh, there's famously an oceanographer called Paul Martin who once said. Uh, give me half a tanker of iron, and I'll show you an ice age. Um, because the idea was that you could, you could, you know, with just a little bit of fertilization, uh, um, uh, catalyze so much carbon removal that you could actually sort of, uh, um, you know, reverse the accumulating greenhouse effect completely and, and sort of drop global temperatures. Um, now, subsequent science has suggested that uh, the ocean biogeochemistry is a lot more difficult than that. Um, you don't get as much bang for your buck as you think when you do the back of the envelope. 
um, because you know um, ocean ecosystems are complicated. You you a lot of that uh, biomass doesn't sink to the deep ocean; it gets eaten at the surface, and you know uh, viruses and every and everything sort of um, surge to to sort of uh, cull the, the 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 new accumulated biomass. So um, uh, uh, so so ocean fertilization, the effect is often a lot weaker than than sort of people hope for. Um, it's, it's a huge topic and, and honestly, yeah, per, perhaps yeah. worth a, a, a podcast episode of its own. One, 100%. Um, and I could recommend people if you want to talk about this. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, people have thought about this for, for a long time and, uh, and, and many people have come away disappointed once they've, the, they've actually sort of, uh, done the experiments. Okay. Right on. Thank you for the soldier in there. Um, and I will, I will follow up on your recommendations. <laughs> um, okay. So, I mean, we're talking manganese, cobalt, nickel, um, I'm just kind of, again, trying to draw some comparisons and I, I'm probably sounding like I'm this like massive, uh, advocate for deep sea mining. I think it's, it's fascinating. It's curious. Ultimately to me, it seems lower impact than like children in the Congo of working in like slave conditions and very unsafe practices to, and it seems like most of the world's con- uh, cobalt is currently sourced from, from Congo. Um, so in terms of the specific minerals we're talking about, can you talk about their relevance and also where they're currently sourced and I guess the kind of relative environmental impacts of sourcing them from the deep sea versus uh, the terrestrial environments they're currently um, mined from? Sure. Yes. So so we're talking, yeah, manganese, nickel, uh, copper and cobalt. Uh, so these these minerals to people who are involved in the energy transition, the first thing they think about is batteries. Um, so specifically, the, 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 the sort of top of the line, most energy dense uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt or NMC batteries that are, are used in, in sort of uh, long range electric vehicles and that would probably have to be used for similar sort of energy, high energy density requirements like uh, long range trucking or, uh, you know, uh, electric ocean cargo ships or electric aviation would probably have to use the most energy dense uh, batteries available. So, so, so these sort of NMC batteries currently. Um, now, there are alternative batteries like uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries that do not use uh, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. But those batteries are less energy dense. They are very suitable. They are very. Uh, they are uh, increasing in popularity, particularly in sort of dense urban South Asia and East Asia, um, where you don't need to where you don't drive as long distances, you could sort of do with smarter, smaller cars, et cetera. Um, and LFP, the future of LFP is, is going to be bright, but a lot of the sort of, um, uh, sort of ind- industry analysts uh, that are that like uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance or Fraunhofer uh, are really thinking that NMC still will remain the, the sort of the plurality of electric vehicle uh, battery chemistries um, going forward until, uh, until at least you know, 2030, the mid 2030s. Um, now, I want to also call out that uh, these minerals are not just used in electric vehicles. So many people are not aware of this, even even especially in the in you know the deep sea mining uh, um, uh, debate. But uh, nickel and manganese are used in many ubiquitous uh, steel and aluminum alloys, and steel and aluminum are very much going to also be metals of decarbonization. These are going to be used. In vast quantities, whether it's to build, you know, hydrogen pipelines or nuclear power plants or uh, transmission infrastructure, for which you're you're also going to need a lot of copper for those substations. Um, uh, so so the so uh, people are people talk about uh, deep sea metals too often as if it's just batteries, but it really poses sort of pan energy transition implications. As for where they're sourced, uh, currently most nickel is mined in Indonesia, most cobalt is mined in. In, in the Congo, with an increasing share of, of cobalt actually sourced as a byproduct, by, byproduct of nickel mining in, the, in Indonesia. Most manganese is sourced from uh, South Africa. And then uh, copper is more is, is a longtime commodity that humans have mined at large scales. And so the copper supply chain is more sort of broadly distributed around the world. What does um, these deep sea resources, I'm just trying to think of the scale, both of like how, how does the scale in terms of actually being a, um, you know, a, a sizable percentage of, of demand and take potentially take pressure off of terrestrial um, deposits, um, but also the scale of the kind of reserves and, re- and resources out there. Does this like markedly change the amount of copper we have available in the world um, for, you know, whatever the applications are we choose to use it for? So it's funny you started with copper because copper is actually one example of where currently we think there's way more resources actually in land-based resources 
than in the in the richest uh, sort of nodule area that everyone's excited about, the Clarion Clipper Tin. So so um, so copper is actually one where land based resources are still perhaps the majority, although we know so little about the seafloor that 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 understanding may well be wrong. Um, for manganese in particular, we know that there's way more on the seafloor. Um, uh, cobalt, that is very likely to be ca the case as well. There's, there's likely to be more cobalt in these deep sea nodules than there is on land. Um, and, and then finally for nickel, it's about the same. Uh, so the currently known nodule resources versus currently known terrestrial nickel resources is about the same order of magnitude. Not just the same order of magnitude, about the same scale. Yeah, sorry. In, ter in terms of the overall efficiency of of like ore extraction, um, how does it compare? I mean, these these sound like little kind of underwater drones and collection ships. Um, what are people's projections of uh, how much this could be scaled? What percentage of you know cobalt you could shift away from uh, children mining in in Congo towards? Um, this very flashy, high tech <laughs> way of extracting. Yeah, notes. yeah. I do want to just jump in and say that you know, ever, like a lot of people, and for I'm I'm glad that a lot of people are concerned about you know, uh, uh, child, child abuse of child labor in the Congo uh, for cobalt. But I, I do want to call out that you know the Congolese government and international and sort of in, with international partners are doing a lot to try and make cobalt cobalt mining in the Congo better. So I do just want to call that out for for a moment and and recognize that you know it's not just a um, an, an unsolvably uh, uh, bad situation. There are a lot of people working very hard to, to sort of uh, make that uh, um, uh, mineral ecosystem economy better. Um, uh, but certainly uh, um, uh, deep sea mining is, is projected to be a, a bit of a game changer, potentially. Um, the one thing, one thing that's very uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, one thing that's very important to note is that all the op all the operators who are proposing to collect nodules are suggesting that they would be a much lower cost than a lot of existing production um, because it's such a more streamlined operation, robots to pipes to ships, and the ships just go straight to a processing facility uh, on shore. Um, it's a way more streamlined op uh, operation than a terrestrial mine where you have to do the mine plan, and then you may have to build the mine for two or three years, the mine development phase, maybe maybe two or three years before you're even uh, producing metal. And then you know, you've got these successive stages of getting to each rock layer, et cetera. It's much more involved. Um, so deep sea mining could scale rather quickly, um, and it could also um, uh, dramatically change uh, these, these sort of uh, commodity markets. It could change sort of uh, the, the cost production curve of cobalt or nickel as we know it. Maybe getting back to, um, I, I don't know if you can, so, so you're saying these are these are scalable. This, is, this wouldn't be, if, if this were kind of unleashed from a regulatory perspective, um, this could be like a significant contributor, as you're saying, not necessarily in, in copper, but in, in cobalt, manganese, and nickel, just to confirm that. This, this is, you know, because we hear about in, within the energy transition discourse, we constantly hear about these pilot projects, many of which don't have a hope and hell of scaling. Uh, but that consume a vast amount of oxygen in terms of the popular discourse and media. So I just want to get a sense, is this one of those things or this has potential, uh, you know, scalability to it that, that will be impactful for extending reserves and, again, hopefully minimizing uh, ecological impact to terrestrial ecosystems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll put some numbers to this. So, so you know, a, a, a lot of these operators are talking about scaling up within a few years, within just a couple of years. Um, uh, to uh, collecting on the order of hundreds of thousands of dry, of tons of dry nodules, uh, dry you know once they've been uh, once the water weight has has left them uh, per year. And so you know if you think about these nodules being composed of uh, like thirty percent manganese by mass, um, and then uh, you know around uh, one percent of nickel nickel and co uh, nickel and copper, uh, and then around 0.2 percent cobalt. Um, so you're talking, you know, tens of thousands of tons of manganese uh, production per year. That's already the equivalent of one terrestrial mine. Um, and then, uh, um, uh, you know, on the order of hundreds to thousands of tons of of, uh, of nickel and and, uh, and cobalt, uh, which would already put them, you know, which are, would already put them on the map in terms of, uh, uh, of of production of these commodities. So you know, it wouldn't start out as as you know. It's, it wouldn't be as if another in, another Indonesia's worth of production springs into existence overnight, um, but they are scaling rapidly enough that um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know it's 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 the equivalent of putting uh, new terrestrial mines into operation much 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 faster than uh, than sort of the existing uh, commodity uh, economy would be able to do so. 
And that, that's a major choke point, uh, particularly in terms of permitting. We're, we're saying this might be difficult in terms of existing ocean conventions, but uh, sure as hell ain't easy to build a mine in the United States, for example, right now. And, and you know, in terms of working your way through the permissions and, and whatnot else. Um, so is this happening? Um, a, is there like an environment in which this is being tested out? Um, are the regulations such that, it, you know, I guess similar to a lot of uh, geoengineering uh, research, you just can't even do it. It's all theoretical and being done, you know, but with modeling and things like that. Or are people actually building these robotic vehicles and snipping off a few nodules and feeling it out? Uh, no, existing international law does permit for small level tests. Um, okay. uh, uh, so there are actually uh, not just uh, not just uh, private uh, um, not just private entities, but also government entities. Like for example, NOAA has conducted deep sea mining testing in this uh, Clarion Clipperton zone, zone of nodules between Hawaii and the United States. Um, uh, and so these are. Uh, um, these are full scale in this in the sense that the vehicle and the rate of nodule collection, et cetera, are are the same as what you'd be you'd expect in a commercial operation. It's just not like twelve vehicles down there harvesting at once. It's just one, and they're studying the impacts of that one vehicle. But but you know essentially they are doing you know full scale pilot testing already. So this means that there's actually already hard scientific data that that we're that we can talk about and that we are talking about in terms of informing regulations and debating what over how strict regulations can be but commercial mining so far is not permitted um uh, and the the international seabed authority which is the international governing body that has um the responsibility for overseeing and regulating sort of uh seabed ac economic activities like nodule collection is currently in the process of formulating a mining code um they were they are actually already overdue for when they were supposed to to finalize a mining code, um, uh, um, but uh, the expectation is that they're, they're supposed to make significant progress on it uh, by this summer. Um, so, uh, uh, so there's a so in terms of you know uh, legality, there is actually a pathway towards uh, legality where at some point um, the, the International Seabed Authority is supposed to say, okay, these are the standards you have to meet if you want to collect nodules. So are these the kind of only minerals um, that we're looking at? I, these nodules sound like kind of a, a unique phenomenon. Um, is there the opportunity or, you know, and I, I guess as you're saying, uh, this really is kind of a final frontier. We've got some vessels that go down and kind of map out the seafloor from what I understand. But um, there's many, many places I'm guessing certainly no human has ever been close to, but maybe also any submersibles never been close to. Is there like a vast El Dorado? Are there other potential um, you know, what, what, are, what are the known knowns? What are the unknown and knowns in terms of what other, um, you know, resources and minerals we could, we could find down in the abyssal, uh, layers, if I'm using the right terminology. <laughs> uh, so, so, um, uh, so, so Norway, for example, recently made the news, um, because they are, uh, in, within their own territorial waters, which don't fall under the uh, the the boundaries of the uh, the governance of the International Seabed Authority. Norway recently has made moves um, towards uh, towards uh, exploratory uh, 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 sea seafloor nodule collection off of Svalbard, which is an island that belongs to Norway's Norwegian soil uh, in the far in the far far, far north of Norway. Um, so there are other nodule areas on the seafloor around the world. Uh, those nodules may differ. To minor to moderate degrees in terms of their 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 mineral composition, uh, they might have you know slightly less manganese and slightly more nickel, vice versa. Um, in general, the the if we're talking nodules, uh, we're we're talking these four metals. There have been um, uh, discussions and and sort of there has been some thinking about whether you could get other uh, uh, metals economically out of these nodules, like rare earth metals, for example. But now we're talking much 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 smaller. Uh, proportions uh, of the nodule by weight, where that might not be economic, or it might be, um, we're not sure yet. So, so currently, uh, um, uh, a lot of people are not making any promises about what else you could get out of these nodules. Um, so I think it's fair to say, for the most part, that this is mostly a conversation around uh, nickel, copper, manganese, cobalt. And just briefly, you mentioned uh, two other forms of deep or of underwater mining, uh, continental crust and thermal vent mining. And you said that these were a kind of no-no for you uh, ethically, morally, scientifically. I'm not sure what. Um, just if, just briefly, if you can outline what those are, if, if they're different minerals that are involved, why they're being pursued and, and why you don't think they're a good idea. 
Um, sure, I'm less well versed on on what's in in those deposits, but I, my understanding is that um, uh, it is different. They, there are there are different metals available, like for example, platinum group metals or rare earth metals. Um, the and then the um, yeah, as for sort of why I'm I'm more more hesitant about about those. Those would involve sort of actual sort of uh, so particularly for hydrothermal vents, those are actually more more ecologically rich areas. Um, hydrothermal vents are where uh, um, are where are areas of the seafloor where you'll see a lot more sort of biomass and biodiversity. Um, there are these very unique sort of uh, uh, communities that have been built around sort of essentially um, uh, nuclear reactor. Um, you have you have plants <laughs> that are yeah living off of these uh, these these hydrothermal um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know geysers underwater with that are rich in minerals and, and you, you essentially have plants that have adapted to to take those minerals and, cor- and incorporate it, incorporate them and grow as biomass. Um, so, so these areas are, are, um, uh, are different than the abyssal seafloor, which arguably speaking is the most common, sur- land, uh, is the most common surface area on earth and, and much less, uh, much, much less biomass rich. Okay. I mean, I think, uh, we've, we've really worked through a lot. I, it's, it's great interviewing you because you, you kind of answer pretty, pretty, uh, promptly. And I feel like I've, I ask questions with, with too many questions buried in them. Uh, so I'll give you an opportunity just, I guess, in wrapping up, um, maybe, maybe just to talk about, you know, you're, you said you've changed your mind on this. Um, you're part of a broader discourse on this topic. Um, first off, like who's talking about it? Because if this is just the proponents talking about it, it's going to be kind of biased and balanced in that way. Um, and, and what does that discourse look like? Are you hopeful that, you know, it's, it's going to not necessarily the mining activity, but that the discourse, um, is intelligent, um, that, you know, cause I, I think, you know, again, this is sort of Jonathan Hadian of me, but I'm really sort of starting to really appreciate the breadth of political discourse and that we have, you know, libertarians and communists and everything in between. I think we are faced with a new problem like a pandemic or whatever. It's it's good that we don't all see it through the same political lenses. So uh, I, I'm glad that there's, you know, people that, uh, you know, oppose everything. I mean, not that they oppose everything. <laughs> I think you know what I'm trying to get at. Uh, it's, it's good to have opponents. It's good to, uh, you know, red team ideas. So um, tell me a bit about the the discourse about this, uh, and and if you think it's a healthy one or not. Sure, I, I do think there's a there's a healthy scientific discourse going on. Um, uh, the 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 academic literature is is sort is on the subject is very is very sort of vigorous, um, uh, and I think that will do a great deal of good in terms of actually reforming sort uh, in sort of in actually informing the regulatory discussions that are going on at the International Seabed Authority. The public discourse I am quite dissatisfied with. I think actually um, it's often the case that, that people come away reading articles on, on you know, a deep sea mining study or, um, or about deep sea mining, the, the topic in general, and come away without actually having learned that much about, about the subject. Um, so I think the public discourse could, could really serve to benefit. Um, and, and, you know, as far as where I... Um, um, uh, where I see the discourse going, you know, whether I'm whether I'm I'm hopeful, um, I I'm actually somewhat concerned that um, that we're not talking about this uh, this this uh, you know this technology with as much sort of um, uh, critical think critical critical thought as it deserves, with the ultimate risk that we may be shutting out a technology that could. You know, reduce the 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 overall impacts with which we we source metals for the energy transition, but we won't consider it because on the face of it, it sounds horrendous. Which I totally understand because that's where I was uh, several years ago. And what really changed my mind was actually finding out how dissatisfactory this public discourse was. Once they actually um, compared the claims that many opponents were making about how this was going to decimate you know tuna fisheries or um, or you know, send noise across the oceans for hundreds of kilometers, or release toxic metals. And then I, you know, I, I read these claims, and then I actually read the underlying studies, and I realized that these claims were being completely inflated, or in some cases, cases even fabricated by by opponents um, in ways that 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 directly diverge with the science, even as if as they were sort of screaming, you know, listen to the scientists on on deep sea mining. They were sort of making up their own findings to, to do so. And that was really uh, a large part of the turning point for me where I, where I sort of realized that, that a lot of the opposition uh, was not coming from having carefully reviewed the evidence, but was rather coming from more sort of fundamental, fundamental sort of on principle opposition to, to this activity, no matter how it is done uh, and, and you know, no matter to what scale. 
Well, Steve, I think that was a good summary. Um, and thank you for coming on. Again, it's been a bit of a quest uh, to find someone um, to speak about it, who's qualified, who's a good communicator. And I think you uh, tick all those boxes. Um, so thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Chris. It was my pleasure.